So again, we are going to be talking about strategies to encourage long-term learning in the classroom. Um, as I said, this seems, and as you all mentioned, this seems to be a larger issue. Uh, <laughs> okay, no worries, Tamara. Um, this seems to be a larger issue with our incoming students, um, whether they have gone straight from K through 12 into college or if they're returning. Um, Long-term learning and lifelong learning are uh, skills that students, all people have to learn. And so we wanna make sure that we are helping them learn these things so that they retain information, but it will serve them in their lives beyond um, beyond the university too. So again, my name is Dr. Lindsay Reeland. My pronouns are she, her, but y'all can call me Lindsay. I'm um, an inclusive teaching coordinator for the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning here at NIU. Um, and I'm excited to be talking about this with you all because uh, I have experienced these issues with my own students when I was teaching. Um, and I've been hearing these issues come from students uh, that I know on a personal basis too, that aren't necessarily in my classes, that they're not retaining the information, um, that they're cramming for tests and they don't know what to do about that. They don't know how to break this cycle. So, Today, we're going to be learning how to model and share studying techniques to assist our students in learning outside of the classroom. We're going to also cover some um, ways to use student mistakes as opportunities for learning and growth um, and creating this environment that encourages informational retrieval and application of knowledge, um, especially through mistakes. Mistakes can be really vital. Um, in the learning process. And we're gonna also discuss methods to actively engage students in the learning process, encouraging long-term learning. So the basics of long-term learning are that learners need to interact with information and practice skills, not just have knowledge deposited. So we can't just dump information into their brains and expect them to be able to uh, use that information and apply that information in the future. Short-term memory, probably. Some people can do this, uh, this info dump and use that information in the long run. And those are beautiful, beautiful brains. And uh, they aren't common, unfortunately. We also have to keep in mind that students are also likely taking more than one class. So even if we are, even if they are able to uh, cram that information into their brains, um, there's a lot of things that they're learning all at the same time. There's a lot of things that they are uh, taking in. And so it's hard for them to take in so much information from your class alone, let alone possibly four other classes um, or, or even more for, for some of our students. So we wanna make sure that we are doing student center activities and discussions to help them avoid cramming for exams or being underprepared in general. And I know some of our classes don't um, don't lend themselves necessarily to doing a lot of activities and discussions because we have so many students. So we're going to talk a little bit about how what that might look like if we have classes that are, you know, 50 and, and up. Because even a class of 50 students is a lot to manage. That's harder for students to move around because you have a bigger classroom. You probably have um stadium style seating you might not have desks that move you know what does that look like so we'll talk about that in a second so to um the things that we're going to cover 
um, are primarily practicing um, informational retrieval, um, information retrieval, excuse me, um, how that might happen in the classroom, how we might use authentic learning methods, um, how we might share and model studying techniques, and how we're going to learn through mistakes. And I want to acknowledge up top that doing these things, it's probably going to take time away from traditional lecture. It's probably going to take time away from um, typical group work that you might be doing. It's going to be um, thinking about how to use your time differently during class. Uh, some of these things you could make videos and upload them and have students sort of thinking about these things on their own time. Um, or, you know, incentivizing them to come to office hours to uh, work through these things with you. But it's likely going to take away time from um, what you traditionally do in the classroom. And so that's hard. That's something that has to be uh, adjusted and those changes can be difficult uh, to, um, to figure out, to a lot and change the amount of things that you're going to be doing within the class that day. So uh, I just wanna note that this isn't necessarily easy. It's not necessarily a quick fix. Um, some of these changes might come over time because you're not sure how to get through the things that you need to get through during class and do these at the same time. And that's okay. There isn't a one size fits all for uh, delivery of this. So a few ways that we might practice information retrieval because we're, we want our students to continue to access information that we have taught them previously. If we are in a first year class, we might be looking at, um, uh, or excuse me, like a, a, a lower level class that might have first year students. Um, so your 100 or 200 level classes, uh, you might be doing information retrieval from um, the first part of the semester after midterms. So seeing what they remember, um, seeing if they can uh, recognize what, what you've been doing, how it connects to what you're doing in the future. Um, or if you're coming into a higher level class that's for majors, what have they learned along the way? What information are they um, able to understand? Can they tell you, like, what can they tell you about, um, I don't know, the uh, economic powers of World War II or whatever that is. So, one way to do this is to uh, do a brain dump activity. So having students write down all the information that they recall. Um, and this doesn't have to be something that they turn into you. This doesn't have to be uh, full sentences. Students seem to love that when I tell them they're not gonna turn it into me and they don't have to write um, full sentences. It doesn't have to have good grammar. We don't need punctuation. Just write some stuff down. Um, so this can be an opportunity for them to see what they retained, um, but it can also show them what their gaps in understanding are. So uh, you could be specific and say, okay, um, we're going to do a brain dump activity about research papers. So I want you to think about um, what a thesis statement needs, what this part needs, um, how do you uh, create a paragraph for uh, a research paper, things that, you know, what, what would the citation look like? What are the elements of that? And so you can give them sort of like main points that you want them to think about. And if they realize they don't remember anything about citation, okay, that's a clear gap. Um, if they realize that they don't know that they need evidence in their paragraphs, okay, that's a clear gap. Um, so this is something that they could do on their own during study sessions, um, or it can be incorporated into class. Uh, I know some people do this at the end of a class period, and they'll say like, 
okay, this is what we've been talking about today. Take five minutes and write in your own words what we've been talking about. Um, what information did you learn? It's also an opportunity after doing some dense reading for them to, uh, again, think about it in their own words and write down what they've learned. Um, we can take notes, but a lot of times students don't know how to reword things. They don't know how to put them, um, work through those ideas in a way that isn't uh, the words of the text itself or the video or who, wherever they're getting that information. So by doing a brain dump, they're going to be applying the information and thinking about it critically, not looking at the original source. And so that information has to be processed a little bit differently than just looking over at a textbook and writing down the, the thing word for word in their own handwriting. Um, some of us are also um, really familiar with think pair share um, or using peer to peer explanation activities, but giving students an opportunity to talk with their peers is a great way for them to uh, interact with the topics that they're learning and to help each other. So talking about the topics, not just hearing them, is going to really help students remember that information. And it encourages students to think critically, interact with the information, and then they can ask questions. They can ask questions of their uh, peers or in their group, they can say, I don't think I understand this. Do you understand this? And if they don't, then they're more emboldened to ask questions in class, especially if you have very large classes there are a lot of students that are afraid of speaking up. So if you put them in groups and give them an opportunity to ask questions, even if they're just jotting things down on a piece of paper or um, using some sort of app um, that they can, you know, type questions into and it'll pop up on the, you know, projected screen or whatever. Uh, there's a different, there are different ways for that students can ask those questions, but it really gives them an opportunity to ask questions, to think through things, and possibly even teach each other, depending on their level of comfort with the topics and, and what they understand. Uh, dual coding is multiple methods of representation. So uh, typically it's associating language with visuals. So um, many of us are probably familiar with this too. So like today, I'm showing you a PowerPoint and I'm talking at the same time. Um, I'm not just sending you a PowerPoint. You're not just looking at my face. Um, looking at my face could be great for some people, but uh, actually seeing the words, actually uh, having me talk about this with you gives you something to ground that information in. To, and then if I were to share my PowerPoint with you in the future, you might know how to, uh, where to go to access particular information, um, especially if there are visuals like pictures or graphs uh, that are working to really uh, create a connection between um, language and its meaning and something uh, visual. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it, like I said, could be a lecture or a talk or something with video uh, or audio and visual components. Um, if you're teaching online, you can give students PowerPoints, but um, if you can talk through those PowerPoints, if you can give them um, videos from Nat Geo to back up what you're seeing about um, carnivorous plants or whatever the topic is. Uh, if you can give them a graph of something so that they understand the water cycle. Um, but you can also give them an opportunity to say, okay, we're learning about um, the, the water cycle and give them an opportunity to create those visuals on their own um, and then possibly share them with others. So, okay. Uh, create some sort of graph or uh, create a photo 
or not a photo, excuse me, create some sort of a picture or visual representation of uh, what the components of uh, uh, my brain has gone completely away. Uh, visual components of, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, war or something. This is where we are in the summer. I forget all of the classes that are being taught. I'm so sorry. Um, but if we're going to break down like, okay, how did this war impact um, economics? What were uh, the rates of casualty? What were the countries or whatever that were impacted? There are ways that we can sort of visually represent that and not just give stats, not just give uh, numbers. And so many of us can find this stuff, but we can also have students create this stuff. Um, a lot of us are scared of AI, um, but using AI tools can make this easier. So students don't necessarily have to create or manipulate uh, photos themselves. They could go onto AI and create a physical representation of Richard III based off of the description of him um, in Shakespeare's plays. So that's an interesting way of interacting with the text and thinking about the characters that wouldn't necessarily be as easy without AI. So there are tech things and tool things that we can use to make this a little bit easier. And also students generally know how to use this stuff. So it's a great way for them to uh, practice using those tools, think about using them in a way that um, benefits their learning instead of uh, creating opportunities for them to uh, circumvent learning by, by using them to uh, do the work for them. We can also share and model studying techniques and classes. So uh, some of us might be familiar with Pomodoro se sessions, excuse me. And so Pomodoro is a structured, timed um, system that breaks up work and uh, rest times, and it encourages productivity and brain breaks. So it'll be okay, I'm going to read this book or I'm going to write this thing for, um, traditionally it's 25 minutes of focused work and then a five to 10 minute break. So a lot of people will say, okay, I can only use this page. I can only interact with this uh, Word document and this book in front of me for 25 minutes. My phone is over here. I can't touch this thing. I can't go to any other web pages. Um, or it might be just this work uh, or this this Word document and this web page, or um, I have to handwrite notes for this amount of time, whatever it is. Um, so traditionally, it's 25 minutes of work and then five to 10 minutes of break. Uh, and then if you want to do a full cycle, uh, or for completed cycles, they recommend a 20 to 30 minute break after four completed cycles so that you're actually getting brain breaks. You have a chance to go to the restroom. You have a chance to um, answer those messages on your phone. You have a chance to uh, start a new playlist, get a snack, whatever you need to do um, before you go back into focusing on your work. So this is a great way to, uh, this is a great style of uh, studying that might work for students and can definitely be talked about in class. Probably not going to do four cycles in your class, right? But um, if you are moving between tasks in your course, uh, like maybe you have X amount of time dedicated to writing or to reading, or to labs or uh, taking in information from graphs or whatever it is, you might do some sort of timed work like this where you give them 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then give them X amount of time for break before you move into uh, talking about it or 
move into the next activity where maybe they're going to be working with a, a classmate or whatever. So it gives them a, ch a chance to really, really focus on the thing that you want them to focus on. And they get a brain break too. Um, and it's also good to give students a break also if they want to get up and move or get a drink or whatever. And to normalize that that's it's okay if they can only sit for 25 minutes and focus and then they need a little break. Um, space practice is learning over an extended period of time um, and pacing out the review process. So this is going to prevent cramming and give students opportunities to revisit uh, and practice previous lessons. So um, a lot of this uh, a lot of our classes are going to uh, build upon earlier topics. So just because you learned how to write a thesis statement in week one doesn't mean you're not going to use a thesis statement ever again. We're going to be building on that. We're going to be talking about argumentative writing. We're going to be talking about audience. I need you to take that information with you throughout the whole class. So um, in order to help with that, especially as you're moving on to different tasks where students might be sort of forgetting what they uh, were supposed to be focusing on earlier and supposed to be learning, you know, possibly completely new information. You could do regular scheduled study guides and activities that review the uh, previous information and apply it to what you're doing now. Um, and this would be very intentional uh, about how these things connect to the new. You could also revisit old quizzes and um, give them again five weeks later. Maybe it's worth no points, but just get them thinking about like, oh, yeah, this is the information you knew pre previously. Maybe this is the information that you know now. Um, what do you know? What are you carrying with you? And why does that matter? Um, and that goes along with the regular low takes, low stakes, excuse me, testing. So uh, when you're giving exams and you're assessing learning, it's really helpful to give students uh, low stakes testing to give them to practice testing, um, especially because there's often um, test anxiety. Uh, everybody's tests look different, just like everybody's essays look different when you're assigning them. So give them an idea of, of what yours look like, but also give them an idea of what they should be uh, thinking about, what they need to review. Um, it also gives you an idea if you want to look over the results, what you need to review. Um, what would be helpful for you to uh, focus on again in class or create little uh, snippets of, of sections to share on your um, Blackboard page or whatever to go over um, reptiles again or whatever it is that you that you see students are um, continually missing uh, points or missing information on. And these could be incorporated into the class, or you could even give uh, like a practice exam and have students do it outside of class in a study session while they're preparing for um, the bigger exam that's coming in a week. So giving them an idea of, of uh, what's to come and giving them an idea of where their gaps are um, can be really, really helpful. And some of these things could be worth you know, out in a class that's out of, let's say, a thousand points, it could be worth five points to do um, this practice exam. It could be worth five points of extra credit to do the practice exam. Doesn't have to be worth anything, doesn't have to be um, incentivized. But if you give students these opportunities to uh, work on things, and do it in a way that feels safe to them, um, it can be really, really helpful. Uh, some of us, again, we're, 
we might already be doing this and using authentic learning methods, but if we can create a connection to real life situations and contextualize information using concrete examples, that's really, really helpful for students to understand the connection and understand the importance. Um, so if you're able to connect it to their, their lives, their interests, the communities and cultures that they belong to, or that they recognize that they uh, think are important, that can be really, really big. So it's awesome to learn about marketing, but having students create a marketing campaign for something that they are personally interested in, whether it's they like Nike, they're a big shoe head and that's their, their favorite brand. So they're gonna focus on that and um, a project, amazing. Um, but it could also be something that, you know, they could pretend they have their own company and they can make it whatever they want. So. Uh, are they able to have that personal connection to what they're learning so that they can practice these things, but it also uh, feels real to them so that they're going to contextualize that information in a way that is meaningful and be able to draw that out later. Um, giving them authentic learning opportunities. So authentically applying the skills or the information um, using tools or technology. Um, so if you're going to, again, be talking about like marketing and talk about uh, ad campaigns or whatever, are you giving them an opportunity to use something like Photoshop in order to create uh, a, a campaign? Um, are you giving them an opportunity to use live models to I don't know, sell perfume or whatever they want to do for that assignment. Um, and as far as technology goes, we are constantly getting more and more technology. Um, Adobe has a new uh, creative cloud, I think is what it's called, that uh, just came out and we all have access to right now. So uh, there are tools there like Photoshop, uh, AI, things that we can edit pictures or create pictures or create brochures or whatever. So we have some tools available to us at NIU for free for our students and ourselves. So um, please let me know if you have questions about that because I can help you uh, find the tools that you're looking for if you want to integrate these into your class, especially now that they're free. It's easier to do that and it's less strain for students. Um, anyway, we can also uh, give them opportunities to apply this information to address problems or simulate scenarios from the field. Um, it's not uncommon for people when they're teaching persuasive writing to have students write a letter to um, a guardian or a loved one about something that they really want to happen. Um, or write a letter to um, to a politician, um, to someone who has weight in the government, to ask them to do something that's important to them too. Um, so those are all examples of how you know they can they can use these these techniques, these skills, this information, and actually apply it to um, something that they might do outside of the class, but also practice, right? And and really um, create a connection between real life scenarios and this information. And this also gives a students an opportunity to demonstrate their learning um, and recognize gaps in their understanding. Um, correcting mistakes, I think, is a huge thing that we're talking about more and more in um, the field of of higher education and thinking about uh, the learning process and what we are doing that doesn't necessarily flow with the natural learning process within higher education, but also within K through 12. 
And so giving students the opportunity to correct their mistakes when they make them really helps them solidify information and demonstrates that learning is a process and that you're not supposed to automatically understand something just because somebody told you it. So it could be something where in an in-class activity, uh, you put something on the board um, for, I don't know, for physics, a problem that was, uh, that was done and was done wrong, and you have students correct that mistake. Um, but it could also be something where students are reviewing their personal mistakes and correcting them, or if they're working in small groups, might be uh, looking at the mistakes within the small group and correcting them. Um, even uh, returning exams or quizzes and giving them the opportunity to uh, redo things that they got wrong and even asking them to explain. Um, and that's an opportunity that they could, you know, possibly get uh, regraded or make up some of those points. Um, but it will also help that information really stick with them because it's very possible that they crammed for that exam. And so to revisit things that they missed, there's a gap there, there or a misunderstanding there. And this can really help solidify that information. Do a lot of real writing, resumes, memoirs, letter to an individual I choose, identify a problem. Yeah, that's all great opportunities for students to really think about how writing connects to their personal lives. Um, I have a, encountered a lot of students that think that they don't write. Um, and they don't realize that texting is writing. They don't realize that um, posting on social media often involves writing, writing emails to uh, their uh, instructors, to uh, potential people that they you know want to work with their company or that they're looking for resources from. All these things are, are writing. Uh, whether they recognize it or not, same thing, they don't realize or they think that they don't read, but I'm like, you're constantly <laughs> surrounded by information just because you didn't, you know, sit down and, and read uh, an entire book last night doesn't mean that you're not a reader. You're looking at things constantly and reading them and, and taking in that information. And so if we can show them the, that they're doing these things in their own lives already, but we can help sharpen their skills. Um, and that it's going to serve them in the long run, they're more likely to then, you know, accept that, to build off of it, to make space in, um, in their brains and, and in their lives for, for this information. So I'm curious, um, I want to make sure that we have some time for you all to share because I know that you all are doing cool things. Um, and Deborah anticipated this, uh, and I'm so glad that you uh, shared already. But I'm curious, what are some ways that you're encouraging um, long-term learning in the classes that you're currently teaching or that you have taught in the past? Um, and if there are challenges that you've encountered when trying to do these things, if there are particular things that even maybe you're not doing, but you know um, colleagues have done or that you've experienced yourself as students. Um, I'm, I'm curious and I'm interested in hearing any of that. And I'm also happy to answer any questions if you have questions for me. So what are some of the ways that we're encouraging long-term learning? or that you see others doing that. And, you know, to go back to Deborah's uh, comment, real writing and applying these things that, especially students, sometimes they've been told that they're bad writers. They've been told that um, they don't know what they're doing. They have uh, a lot of anxiety or, uh, 
even anger attached to the way that they've been treated in writing classes before or the way that they feel about their writing. And so being able to show them that, okay, it doesn't necessarily have to be a larger research project that you're writing about. Like there are little ways that we are doing these things all the time and that we're going to be doing them in the future. Okay, Bonnie says, asking students to give a personal example of when they experienced a certain sociological concept or phenomenon after first modeling how to apply a funny memorable with a funny memorable personal story of my own. I love that, Bonnie. I love that so much. I think that's something that when I teach um, gender and sexuality uh, studies courses, I do a lot of that too, because some of these concepts and theories can feel so cold and so removed. So if we're talking about, um, I don't know, intersecting identities or whatever, if I can talk a little bit about myself or if I can talk about even um, a character from a TV show or something, if I can talk about Bob from Bob's Burgers, um, that helps them see those concepts and see that and, and understand that in something that they might recognize themselves. Um, but then also maybe apply it to their, to their own lives, to their own uh, situations or the people that are around them. Yeah, I love that. Anything else that we're doing or questions that we have too? I'm curious if any of you are all, um, excuse me, if you're promoting studying or practicing studying in your classes in any way. I think that that's like a, a hard thing to budget time for, but I think it's also sometimes very necessary. Thank you, Deborah. Bonnie says, I'm not, but I'm realizing we should talk about how to study practice at the, least at the beginning of the semester. Yeah, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, if you can give some time to that at the beginning. And then, I mean, depending on when you are, um, when you're planning your assessment, if it seems like, oh gosh, people aren't doing well. <laughs> Um, it's always good to like revisit that, you know, after midterms or whatever it is. Um, but it's also useful to create a short video of your own or use somebody else. If somebody else already explained the Pomodoro technique, um, I would plop that up on my blackboard and have them, you know, somebody else explain it because sometimes it's helpful if somebody else has like a you know, a more engaging way to talk about these topics, but um, giving students resources, whether they're actively using them, you know, like constantly, but at least sharing them somewhere, reminding them where they exist is, is helpful. And then, you know, sometimes you'll have students come up to you um, and have these questions one-on-one, -on -one, like, how do I even do this? And you can be like, oh, we have a repository here. Let me share this with you. Um, Okay. Bill revisits and reworks performances from past years. Uh, that's a great way of uh, incorporating that into your classroom, um, Bill, because some of this stuff is is not as as simple or um, as straightforward for a music classroom. Um, but I love that you are revisiting that stuff um, and letting students think about all of that too. 
I have a habit of sending them to HASC, but I will do more now. I think that sending them elsewhere is fine too. I think sometimes um, it's easier to talk about your struggles with people that aren't grading you. Um, even, even if the person who's grading you is so personable and amazing and wonderful and understanding. Um, but it doesn't hurt to have multiple approaches at the same time. Um, I know that, you know, some of these students are going to be struggling and really need, uh, resources that you can't necessarily provide them with or things that you don't necessarily have the actual time to do because you have so many students. Um, but it, like I said, it doesn't hurt to have these, uh, to have a little repository of information of, you know, how do you study? How do you use this thing? Um, to walk them through, um, how you would use uh, a study guide for your class. Um, things like that are, are always going to be helpful and are generally, you know, you're going to dedicate this amount of time right now to doing it and you can reuse those in the future too. So um, I don't think that that's a bad use of time. And I think that it's also something that we can start thinking about for the fall semester coming up if we're teaching over the summer. Um, it's still pretty, you know, we've, we've got some time to create those resources or to think about how we might incorporate those into our classes right now. Okay. Well, thank you all um, for sharing. Like I said before, if you have any more questions or comments or whatever, uh, I will stick around for a few minutes after I stop the recording. Um, but I just want to finish this up today by saying that it's really worth the time that it takes to create these videos, these resources, and to spend time in class um, to discuss the ways that students can study and work more intentionally. It does take time. It does take effort. Um, and I know that we are all short on that sometimes. Um, so if we can plan ahead, if we can plan now before things start up, uh, that's really, really useful. But at the, at the least creating videos, um, or even saying during my office hours this week, we're, we're in week two, come to my office hours and let's talk about studying or let's talk about, um, intentionally doing X, Y, Z things. And so sort of inviting those conversations outside of class if you don't have the time in class necessarily. Um, also recognizing that, you know, mistakes are going to happen. Don't make students feel bad for them. I'm willing to believe that you all are not. But, um, you know, it can be really heartbreaking when students study hard and they don't get a passing grade on an exam or they got a whole letter grade lower than they thought. So, um, if there are opportunities for them to uh, learn from those mistakes, correct their mistakes, get more points, um, or just prove that that they've learned those concepts or practice those concepts and that they can learn those in the future, I think that's a great opportunity. I think it also is, is really helpful to talk about mistakes as part of the learning process in class so that students don't necessarily feel worn down by that. And um, Bonnie mentioned earlier about connecting um, things from class to your personal life, talking about things, mistakes that you've made or times that you uh, didn't do as well as you thought you would really helps students see that this is, you know, not necessarily something that comes natural to everybody. Learning is a process. It's not, um, you know, an immediate uh, stop on, on their journey in college, right? There, it's going to be easier for some people in some areas, but it's always going to be work. Um, and also, uh, reworking the class 
um, excuse me, reworking the way your classes run, it's difficult. It can be difficult, but it does benefit your students. Um, and we should be continuing to develop and evolve in our courses. Our students are not the same students that we had 10 years ago, um, let alone, you know, five years ago, pre-pandemic. So we need to be thinking about how we're adapting to the, the brains and the learning styles of these students who have grown up, um, you know, the, the ones that have gone through K through 12 and are now in, in college immediately. They've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with uh, internet phones. They uh, have shorter attention spans. Um, they might not be used to handwriting notes. All of these things are going to impact the way that they learn, but they also have had access to so much more information um, by the age of 18 and easily have access to this information by the age of 18 than the generations that came before them. So there are so many benefits that come along with uh, with this new generation of college students, but there's also things that we need to recognize as not working for them that worked for students in, you know, in the 90s or the 2010s. Um, Bonnie, asks, do you have a link to a short, a good short video explaining the Pomodoro technique that would be suitable for posting on Blackboard. Bonnie, I will happily share a link with you. Um, I will be sending an email out after this uh, with the recording and everything, and I will give you a video that goes along with that too, as well as all of my resources that I, uh, that I used for this presentation. So, Thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm so happy that you're all here and, and thinking about how these things apply to the students that you're working with and what you all are doing. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Feel free to stick around and ask questions if they come to you.